And we did a pretty darn good job from 1991 to 1998. We fundamentally disarmed Iraq. Now people say, well, Iraq could have done a lot of things from 1998 to 2002. Indeed they could have, but you know, inspectors are there right now. Every single site cited by the CIA and the U.S. government in the fall of, 19, uh, in the fall of 2002 as being evidence of Iraq's continued work in weapons of mass destruction. You remember the briefings, Donald Rumsfeld and other up before you on American TV showing you the photographs of factories that Iraq was rebuilding. Every site has been inspected by inspectors to date and no site has been found to be doing anything of a prohibited nature. In the months before March 2003, a tide of protests was building against the Bush administration and Prime Minister Tony Blair for their plan to invade Iraq. Protesters around the world were joined by heads of state, UN officials, and religious leaders such as the Pope, all speaking out against the invasion. They labeled it a war of aggression. George Bush and Tony Blair denied the charge, preferring to call it a preemptive strike. Again and again, the two leaders tried to gain support by accusing Saddam Hussein of stockpiling weapons of mass destruction and having links to Al-Qaeda. Tony Blair's famous smoking gun speech claimed that Saddam could use his weapons in as little as 45 minutes. In a speech delivered in Cincinnati in October 2002, President Bush tried to frighten Americans by saying that the smoking gun could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. In his State of the Union speech on January 28, 2003, he declared that the British government had learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. To the President's embarrassment, it was revealed that this statement was entirely false and that the CIA had previously informed him of this fact, causing him to delete it from the earlier speech delivered in Cincinnati. But while these events were unfolding, Scott Ritter, a former intelligence officer holding the rank of major in the U.S. Marine Corps, was warning Americans that they were being manipulated. And more than any other individual, Scott Ritter knew what he was talking about. From 1991 to 1998, he led the U.N. weapons inspection team in Iraq. He was the world's foremost expert on Saddam Hussein's weapons program. Does Iraq pose a threat? to the security of the United States of America that warrants our nation, our republic, going to war. Well, let's talk about weapons of mass destruction. Iraq had them. For that, there is no debate. Iraq had massive programs dedicated to the manufacture of chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, and long-range ballistic missiles. I'm not here today to defend in any way whatsoever Saddam Hussein or his horrific regime. I know more about that regime than just about any American today. And I'm here to tell you, there's, there's, it, it, it's as bad as you have heard, sometimes even worse. Ritter and the UN inspection team were able to see through the lies of Saddam and his scientists. And they were able to determine the true status of the weapons program in Iraq. As a weapons inspector, I worked hard in Iraq from 1991 to 1998 with hundreds of my fellow colleagues to go in and oversee the disarm of Iraq. And as I told you, it wasn't a perfect situation. The Iraqis were not fully cooperating. The governments of the Security Council were not willing to enforce their law. And yet, despite all of this, we had tremendous successes. By 1996, we were able to determine that 90 to 95 percent of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction capability was accounted for, including 100 percent of the factories used by Iraq to produce weapons of mass destruction, together with the majority of the production equipment associated with these factories. Furthermore, we were able to mitigate this uncertainty about the remaining 5 to 10 percent that's unaccounted for by noting that from 1994 to 1998, we monitored the totality of Iraq's industrial infrastructure, that which could be used by Iraq to produce weapons of mass destruction. We call it dual-use capabilities, a factory that can produce legitimate material, but if converted, could produce prohibited. We monitored this from 1994 to 1998 and never once found any evidence of retained prohibited capability or efforts by Iraq to reconstitute. So inspections were fairly successful, but weren't, they didn't achieve that 100 percent. They didn't achieve that 100 percent. Now, how did we get to the level that we did get? And some people might be fair to ask, 100 percent of what? 
I mean, if Iraq lied to you, if they submitted false declarations, how do you know you got 100%, 90 to 95% of what? What's your baseline? Well, you know, we learned a long time ago not to trust what the Iraqis told us. They lied to us too many times. They don't get the benefit of the doubt anymore. But I learned also trust the hard work of my inspectors. We interrogated the Iraqis. We carried out good inspections, intrusive inspections. We took the work outside of Iraq. We went to Europe, to the countries that sold Iraq this material. We investigated trips made by Iraqi scientists. We got the immigration records, found out what days they visited a certain country, found out what hotels they stayed in, traced their phone calls to German companies or French companies, and they went to those companies and demanded access to the records so that we were able to ascertain what Iraq had procured. So when we went to an Iraqi scientist and said, how many machine tools of a certain type did you buy? And he said, two, only two. I swear it was like yesterday, only two. We could now confront him with a document that showed he, in fact, bought 15. And his signature at the bottom showed he had received it. And suddenly the Iraqi scientist had a great memory. And he said, yes, 15, 15, of course. And he would take us to the other 13 that were missing. That's how we disarmed Iraq, not by believing what the Iraqis said, but by the hard work of the weapons inspectors. There's a lot of concern out there about VX nerve agent today. People will talk about it. It's unaccounted for. Yes, it's unaccounted for. You know, one reason why we have such concerns is the Iraqis lied about it for so long. They said, we don't have any VX nerve agent. So we inspectors, believing they did, would always investigate. We had intelligence that they produced it at one facility in, at this factory called Mufana State Establishment. We had this Dutch inspector, Case Walterbeck, a very good inspector, who would often go to this Mufana State Establishment and look wistfully at the building where we had information that VX had been produced, but it had been stripped clean by the Iraqis. There was nothing left. He would look at the building and then move on. And he'd do this week after week. And finally, the Iraqis came up to him and said, Mr. Walter, why are you looking at this building? And he turned to him in frustration and said, because I believe that's where you had your VX nerve agent program. And the Iraqi, oh, no, Mr. Walter Beck. We never had a VX nerve agent program there. We had it over here. <laughs> and, he, and he pointed to a building that had been bombed during Desert Storm hit with a 2,000-pound bomb, collapsing the roof on top of it. And a flash goes through Case's mind. You know, inside that building is a snapshot of what Iraq's capabilities were at the time of the bombing. That collapsed building means whatever documents were there, whatever material there is still there. So Case became a forensic archaeologist, sending a team in, lifting the roof up, crawling in, and gathering the documents. And it proved that Iraq had a basic research and development pilot plant for, uh, for VX nerve agent. And uh, we went to the Iraqis and said, why didn't you declare this? And they said, well, the declaration, you know, said it was dated April. It said, declare our holdings of weapons of mass destruction. You blew up the building. We didn't have that capability anymore, so we just didn't declare it. And they sort of had a point, <laughs> except that when we went through the documents, we asked the Iraqis, how much VX did you produce? And they said, just, you know, small amounts, 30 liters, 50 liters. And suddenly the documents were finding out that they produced three tons, four tons. We said, hey, you're lying here. And some of the Iraqis had to admit that it was more than just a research and development facility. It was a pilot production plant. But they said, don't worry about it. It's all destroyed. But we said, okay, but we have to account for all the material. Where did you dispose of the material? They took us to a field. And they said, this is where we buried it, the precursors, the VX. It's all buried in here. And we did soil samples. We found out, yes, much had been destroyed, but we couldn't guarantee all of it. We said, how did you bring it here? And the Iraqis said, well, we brought it here in these steel vats, but what are you worried about? It's VX. It's not stable. I mean, the stuff's useless. Within days, it deteriorates. It, this is all much ado about nothing. We said, well, just show us the, the vats. So we went to the vats, and sure enough, they'd been cleaned out, swept clean with Clorox, no evidence, except at the end, there's this little purge valve. And one of our inspectors stuck a swab up the valve. There was liquid, put the liquid in a plastic bag, took it to the lab, stabilized VX. The Iraqis had lied to us again. So now we confront them. You stabilize VX. Yeah, we did, but you know, we never put it in a weapon, they said. Never put it in a weapon. So it wasn't weaponized. So we went to the weapons destruction pit, looked at where they had destroyed the weapon, we grabbed the, 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 the shards, scraped off residue, took it to a lab, and we found the degradation byproduct of weaponized VX. I said, well, yeah, but there's nothing here. I mean, we never, we never built a factory out of it. In fact, in 1997, we found 200 crates of material that were being hidden by the Iraqis that would have been used for a VX nerve agent factory. We found it, and we destroyed it. So let me ask you, where do we stand on VX nerve agent? Does Iraq have it or don't they have it? When you look at the accumulation of facts, they had a production plant, pilot production. It's eliminated. They had material. We went to a field. It's eliminated. They say they stabilized it, put it in warheads, but the warheads are eliminated. They say they never had a large-scale manufacturing capability. Well, we eliminated that production equipment. So where do we stand with VX? I don't know the answer. And that's the problem with when we talk about disarming Iraq. Not all the gaps have been filled. Iraq cooperated to a great degree. 
we achieved a tremendous uh, uh, amount of uh, verified disarmament, 90 to 95 percent, but we can't close all the gaps. But why were inspectors in Iraq in the first place? To answer this question, it is necessary to examine the history of U.S. involvement in the Middle East. In particular, how the U.S. government intervened repeatedly in the internal affairs of Middle Eastern countries to control the oil resources in that region. In 1953, for example, the CIA staged a coup in Iran to replace the democratically elected premier, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, with a pro-American dictator, the Shah. Shah Riza Pahlavi's cruel regime was infamous for its Ministry of Security, the dreaded Savak, which tortured and killed countless Iranians for more than 25 years. Needless to say, the cruelty of this ally dug a deep well of hatred for America and its policies. When the Iranians finally revolted against the Shah in 1979 and replaced him with the Ayatollah Khomeini, the U.S. government tried to retain control of the region by entering a partnership with Saddam Hussein, the dictator of neighboring Iraq. Throughout the 1980s, the United States furnished Iraq with chemical and biological weapons and showed Iraqi soldiers how to use them. Similarly, in 1986, the United States became partners with Osama bin Laden and other Islamic radicals enlisting them to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan and supplying them with U.S.-made Stinger missiles. With the end of the Cold War and fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the armaments industry in the U.S. faced massive spending cuts and a vast reduction in political influence. But a dispute soon arose between Iraq and Kuwait, namely that Kuwait was stealing Iraqi oil by slant drilling into Iraqi oil reserves across the border. Iraq registered its complaint with the UN and was preparing to invade Kuwait. When contacted by the Iraqis, United States Ambassador April Glaspie expressed no objection to Iraq's invasion plans. Then, when Iraqi troops crossed the border with Kuwait, President George Herbert Walker Bush turned against his former partner and declared that Saddam Hussein was a new Hitler. The United States then led UN forces in the Persian Gulf War and the US armaments industry was temporarily rescued. With the defeat of Iraq, the UN sent inspectors to oversee the disarmament of Iraq, and Scott Ritter led this team. At the same time, however, the UN issued a resolution to end the economic sanctions against Iraq. The sanctions had been levied in August of 1990, and they were no longer needed because Iraq had withdrawn from Kuwait. But the United States refused to lift the sanctions despite protest within the UN about the toll on innocent civilians as a result of malnutrition and disease. By 1993, when the World Trade Center in New York was attacked for the first time, the terrorists already were citing the sanctions-related deaths of Iraqi children as a motivating factor. But the United States refused to lift the blockade. During a broadcast of 60 Minutes in May of 1996, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State under President Clinton and U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., even stated that the deaths of half a million innocent Iraqi children were worth it to contain Saddam Hussein. It is not surprising that one of Osama bin Laden's most consistent demands was for the U.S. to end the sanctions against Iraq. By 2003, the death toll resulting from these sanctions reached one million, far more than the tally of Saddam's brutal regime. But why did the inspectors leave Iraq in 1998? And weren't sanctions necessary to protect us from Saddam Hussein and his weapons of mass destruction? Scott Ritter punctured these often repeated myths. He explained that the true purpose of the UN inspection team began to change after 1996. Instead of monitoring Iraqi disarmament for the UN, the team was being subverted by US intelligence agencies to accomplish covert US policy goals. In particular, the inspectors were being used to supply information used to eliminate Saddam Hussein, a goal that is outlawed by the UN Charter and contrary to the principles of international law. But it doesn't talk about getting rid of Saddam Hussein. If you'll take a close look at Security Council resolutions, you will not find a single resolution that speaks of regime removal. In fact, read the United Nations Charter, and you'll see the United Nations Charter specifically prohibits regime removal. It says that no nation or group or nation has the rights to go in and pick and choose the leadership of a sovereign state. That is the sole prerogative of the people of that nation. And again, I remind you, because our Constitution says that when we sign the, the United Nations Charter, we must abide by that charter. 
that when the President of the United States says that his policy in regards to Iraq is regime removal, it's an illegal policy. It's a policy that's not only a violation of international law, but ladies and gentlemen, it's a policy which is a violation of the Constitution of the United States of America. But I need to point out that our current president is not the only one guilty of making this, uh, this, this policy and implementing this policy. In fact, policy of regime removal has been in place and in practice since 1991, dating back to the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st president. You know, as a weapons inspector, and my fellow weapons inspectors and, my, and I were confronted with the fact that while we were there to implement international law and to oversee the disarm of Iraq, we had to deal not only with Iraqi obstruction and noncompliance, but also the fact that the United States had stated right from the beginning that even if Iraq fully cooperates with the weapons inspectors, even if the inspectors can find that Iraq has been disarmed, economic sanctions will not be lifted until which time Saddam Hussein is removed from power. So the United States said from the very beginning, we're not going to play the game. What we want is regime removal. What we want is Saddam Hussein finished. And that is not reflective of international law. That is not reflective of what the mission of the weapons inspectors were. So here's the crunch. Implementing the law. So long as the United States of America maintains a policy of regime removal that takes priority over internationally mandated disarmament, the weapons inspection process is inherently corrupted. Inherently corrupted. In the same way that we would be against a police department that's implementing the law. But what happens if a police department goes after a suspected drug dealer and plants evidence? Slides that 30 gram pack of cocaine under the, bread as they, uh, under the bed as they do a, a, a raid on the house and then take the drug dealer off. Now maybe that drug dealer is a drug dealer. Maybe he has a past of, of, of doing bad things. But when the cop plants evidence, when the cop does an illegal search and seizure, when the cop does an illegal wiretap, the cop has corrupt, corrupted due process of law. The cop themselves have become a violator of the law. Therefore, what happens to the suspect? The suspect walks, not because the suspect's innocent, but because the system has failed. And we talk about Iraq, we talk about enforcing and implementing international law, it's not so much, it's not only that we have to hold Iraq accountable to the rule of law, but we have to hold those who implement the rule of law likewise accountable, meaning that when weapons inspectors go into Iraq, their job is to disarm Iraq, not to facilitate the collection of intelligence information to terminate Saddam Hussein's existence. You know, the United States wasn't apologetic about this. They said, our job is to get rid of Saddam Hussein. That's our policy. We're going to get rid of him. But as a weapons inspector, this is unacceptable. A weapons inspector has to be there to implement the law in accordance with the mandate of the council. So we had to change the way we did business. You know, if you took a look at photographs of the early inspection teams, all these distinguished chemists, biologists, nuclear physicists, and rocket scientists, they're all gentlemen in their 40s and 50s. And I'm in my 40s, so I can't complain, I mean, point fingers to anymore, but their necks tended to begin here and end right about here, the little toothpick arms, because their job was science. If you take a look at the photographs of inspection teams afterwards, you got these young strapping men whose necks begin here and end here, and they got arms that come out here, because the nature of the inspection team changed. We so now we come to 1998, weapons inspectors doing their job. We have 90, 95% disarmament. There's not much left for us to find. We're going around Iraq saying we, we, we think we can account for everything. We, we can't find any evidence of Iraq having per, uh, retained this stuff. There's you know, gaps that we have there, but maybe it's time we talk about terminating this job. The United States says, no, you have to get 100%. So the only way to get 100% is to go after that missing 5 to 10%, which requires documentary evidence, which means we have to go looking for documents where? In the palaces, in the security installations. And the Iraqis are afraid of this. Why? Because the United States has a policy of regime removal. So you have yours truly leading inspection teams into the most sensitive areas of Iraq, gaining access to documents, gaining access to information, which upon assessment has nothing to do with disarmament, but when turned over to the United States, has everything to do with empowering the United States to get rid of Saddam Hussein. 
And that's what the United States was focused on doing, getting rid of Saddam Hussein. You ask yourself why inspectors left in 1998. Well, let me tell you, they were not kicked out by Saddam Hussein. That's mythology. They were ordered out by the United States government. They were ordered out after the United States government used the weapons inspection process to facilitate a crisis, a confrontation that then resulted in the United States ordering the inspectors out of the country and then using the removal of inspectors as an excuse to begin bombing, a bombing campaign that was empowered by intelligence information gathered by the inspectors of 97 sites bombed in Operation Desert Fox, 86 dealt with Saddam Hussein's security, all of which were derived from intelligence information gathered by inspectors. The United States failed to get rid of Saddam Hussein, but what they did do is kill the inspectors because having been exposed as nothing more than a front for American intelligence collection, the Iraqis weren't about to let the inspectors back in. And that's the situation we faced from 1998 until just recently, November of uh, 2002, when inspectors went back. And now we have inspectors back. You know, prior to inspectors returning, it was possible for people to make a case for war against Iraq by citing Iraq's noncompliance and by citing the fact that Iraq refused to allow inspectors back in. But today, that case simply can't be made. As I said, we did a pretty darn good job from 1991 to 1998. We fundamentally disarmed Iraq. Now, people say, well, Iraq could have done a lot of things from 1998 to 2002. Indeed, they could have, but you know, inspectors are there right now. Every single site cited by the CIA and the U.S. government in the fall of, 19, uh, in the fall of 2002 as being evidence of Iraq's continued work in weapons of mass destruction. You remember the briefings, Donald Rumsfeld and other up before you on American TV showing you the photographs of factories that Iraq was rebuilding. Every site has been inspected by inspectors to date and no site has been found to be doing anything of a prohibited nature. The Iraqis, the Iraqis today are fulfilling their obligation to fully cooperate with the weapons inspectors. Everywhere the inspectors want to go, the Iraqis are facilitating their work. The Security Council has made it clear that if Iraq doesn't cooperate, it will enforce its laws severely, thereby meeting the second requirement of a successful inspection. And yet we're still confronted with that third polluting factor, the American policy of regime removal, getting rid of Saddam Hussein, which means that Iraq and the international community have to be concerned about what the motives are for the United States in providing intelligence to the weapons inspectors. Is it truly to facilitate disarmament? Or is it about gaining access to information that will facilitate regime removal? And given the fact that the United States has a state of policy of regime removal, we have to be concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you this. The way to stop a war with Iraq is to support the continued work of weapons inspectors inside Iraq. For so long as inspectors are at work in Iraq and getting the cooperation of the Iraqi government, there is no justification for war against Iraq. We must support the work of the inspectors. Having established that Iraq was disarmed and that the underlying purpose of the invasion was regime change, Mr. Ritter explained that this was nothing less than naked imperialism, an outlawed policy that is contrary to the principles of our constitutional republic and a goal that makes the U.S. a target of hatred and terrorism. Furthermore, however, we must ensure that the policies of the United States of America conform with international law meaning that if Iraq is found to be disarmed, then the game is up. You know, it's a simple equation, quid pro quo. Iraq is disarmed, sanctions are lifted, Iraq comes back into the fold of the international community with Saddam Hussein still at the helm, which of course is the last thing the Bush administration wants with its policy of regime removal, which tells you the Bush administration is dead set against disarming Iraq through the means of weapons inspections. No, the Bush administration's vision of disarming Iraq is through military intervention, an invasion, which tells you that this is not about weapons of mass destruction. You see, if the United States wanted to get rid of weapons of mass destruction, we have weapons inspectors who can do that. So what is this about? What is this regime removal truly about? And I'll tell you right now, it's about imperial power, imperialism. And it's something that we as Americans better start thinking about very carefully. In addition to reading the Constitution of the United States, the Gettysburg Address, and the United Nations Charter among documents I would recommend, I'd also recommend that every American familiarize themselves with the National Security Strategy document of the Bush administration promulgated in September of last year. This is a document that defines how we, the people of the United States of America, through our government, will interact with the international community. It states that the United States will take advantage of its overwhelming military and economic strength 
to impose a unilateral American solution on problems unilaterally defined by the United States of America. It says that we will operate outside the boundary of international law, that we alone will determine what constitutes justification for intervention, that we will preemptively intervene when required to defend the United States of America. It doesn't matter what the Security Council says. It's a rejection of multilateralism. It's a rejection of international law. It's an embracing of unilateral, imperial American power, plain and simple. And I have to tell you, as somebody who took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, I am deeply affronted by this policy. As somebody who has studied American history and understands that 220 some odd years ago, our founding fathers fought a revolutionary war to free ourselves from imperial power, I find it abhorrent that today our nation is on the path of becoming that which we rejected. <laughs> we will become instead an imperial power deservant of the enmity and hatred of the international community. We will become the largest lawbreaker the international community has seen. We will reject international law. We will be vilified. We will be opposed. It will mean the end of America. You know, what happens to all imperial powers? They die of indigestion. You go out there and you consume the world and then that kills you. I don't want America to perish. Now, perishing doesn't necessarily mean that we will cease to exist as a body of land populated by people who call themselves Americans. No. We can call ourselves Americans, we can fly the American flag, but unless we stand up and defend the values that define us as Americans, we will cease being Americans. And I'll tell you this too, we're at war against terror right now. We haven't won that war yet. There are still forces out there who desire to do harm against America. And if we go to war against Iraq without support of the international community, without support of international law, we will be the number one recruiting poster for Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and the forces of anti-American Islamic fundamentalism. Mr. Ritter's account was delivered before the United States invaded Iraq in March of 2003. In the months following the war, Administration officials and the President himself admitted that their previous claims about both weapons of mass destruction and connections to Al-Qaeda were false or exaggerated. But the war in Iraq was only the most recent example of politicians lying to promote a war. Americans were literally lied into the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the war in Vietnam, and both wars in Iraq, to name only a few.